And then uh, I'm going down to Ecuador to climb on called Cotopaxi. It's 20,000 feet. I'm going to do that on my 60th birthday, if you can imagine that. I'm going <laughs> to get up to the top and drop down and do 60 push-ups on the summit. So that's the goal. <laughs> I, will, I will stand on top on my birthday. So. Can, can, could we argue for 60 burpees? <laughs> I, I, that's a lot of burpees. I did burpees this morning, I just tell you that. When it's you like challenges, that. there uh, you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Burpees are killer. Hey, how are you doing, Saito? Welcome back to the Sensei Says a Podcast. I am Sensei Pascal. As always, inside my podcast, Dojo in St. Julie, Quebec. Canada, thank you for choosing the SSP today, either on YouTube or the audio platform you're currently listening on. As a quick reminder, the Sensei Says podcast mission goes as follows. We discuss weekly with successful personalities and dig out some actionable advice, which hopefully will help you and me improve our lives and i'm really excited about this week's episode our first follow-up interview actually with mark patterson mark was a guest on episode number three uh, during which we discuss his engagement in the seven summit challenge if you don't know what cha that challenge is it's basically uh, climbing the highest peak on every continent and at the time of uh, the first interview on episode three Uh, Mark had checked the six first uh, summits of the challenge. The only one left was Everest. So this week's episode, we're talking 100% Mark's adventure climbing Mount Everest. I sure learned a lot and I really hope that you learned as much as I did. And if you like this episode, don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell, comment, share to a friend and leave a positive review on Apple Podcast because when we get to 100 reviews, I'm giving away a $100 Amazon gift card. How about that? What I find really interesting with this uh, particular episode, it's the first one that we get to uh, link to a previous episode and it really, it, it really is relevant and it's really exciting to see that the first time we met two years ago, you were actually preparing for what happened last May or June. And we spoke yeah. about all the mountains you did uh, during the first six uh, of the seven summits, all the uh, adventures and misadventures that you lived through, the reasons why you did that. Uh, and my, my first question was watching the documentary and I followed like daily your adventures uh, on, in Nepal and on Everest. Uh, which I found really interesting. It's like, where's my 50K so I can go, <laughs> go and do that myself? It's, uh, the, 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 the scenery is, is it, it's really out of this world. But how did the six first experiences, like the, 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 the first six of the seven, help you in any way to achieve Everest? Well, I look, I, I think it's a lot like, you know, very fortunate playing in the NFL and it's a lot like going in, into the NFL. You don't start in little league when you're eight or nine years old and you make the leap to the NFL to play with professionals. You know, there's a, there's a sort order. There's a chronological uh, way that you work your way through little league and, and then you make your way into high school. Um, and then from there, for me, it was college. And, you know, I went to a, a, a high profile profile program and then uh from there ultimately i got drafted you know and i was ready for that at that time when i was 23 and got drafted by the raiders in the case of the mountains you know number one i grew up in the northwest um out of seattle and there's a lot of mountains you know in that region so cut my teeth on just kind of the smaller stuff and going up and down and but it's exposure and it's being outdoors and You know, it's cold, it's rainy, it's all those things that that we would deal with in Seattle and outside of Seattle. Um, and then it, as it relates to your question, you know, there's like six mountains. Um, when I when I first drew this up, uh, I talked to somebody who had actually done this. They were a mountain guide service, and they they really gave me the roadmap from from the least difficult to the most difficult. The most difficult, of course, is Everest. And so each one of those mountains I was on um, gave me a different um, challenge, 
that I had to learn a new skill that I had to learn. I had to learn how to climb up ice walls. I had to learn how to use a Jumar. I had to learn how to tie my ropes. I learned how to set up tents, you know, all these different, I make ice walls um, to protect your tent from blowing out over. Um, when I was on Denali, it was in minus 80 degree weather, you know, people getting frostbite. How do you deal with that? Right. Mm. Being very remote and, you know, pitching a tent in the middle of the night, um, just in the middle of nowhere, like this is not a campsite per se. It's just like you're done. You can't go any further. You just sit down and start, you know, putting, uh, spikes in, 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 so you can set your tent. So, you know, by the time I got to Everest, I pretty much it was kind of like entering in the NFL for me. You know, I <laughs> had a pretty clear idea. Now there was a lot of things that were so much different that to me, that mountain is a whole different level than anything I'd ever done. Um, in the duration of time, that you spend at Mount Everest. It's probably the most shocking question slash answer that I give is just as a starting point, you're there for two months. And when okay. you're anywhere suffering for two months, um, it's a long way. And you're suffering because you're at 17,500 feet living. You're suffering because you're not eating great foods. You're suffering because it's below freezing every single night below zero. You're suffering because you're sleeping on ice. You're suffering because uh, every time you go up through the Kumba ice fall, it's treacherous. There's avalanches coming down every single day. So, you you know, just the nerves of that and just the unpredictability like we had uh, running into two cyclones as we got towards the top of, you know, things happen. And uh, so that to me um and that's kind of the net net answer is that I was ready for it because I'd spent so much time. It took me nine years to climb those seven mountains. And that ties in uh, exactly into my second question. How different was the actual real Everest uh, compared to the romantic uh, image that we, the, that culture has, has brought to us for, for us, it's like, it's the amazing peak. And I'm sure the first time going, you, may, maybe you had some of these as well. So how much real life was different from what we think uh, might be the romantic uh, um, perspective of Mount Everest? Well, I think there's a lot of people, you know, of the 400 people that were the, the climbers that were up there, there's only 120 of us made it. And of our particular group, 21 showed up uh, to climb Mount Everest. And of the 21, 11 of us made it to high camp, which is 26,500 feet. And of the 11, only 10 made it. So, you know, there's Ed Veaster, another famous climber, um, has this saying called, there's no shortcuts to the top. And at the end of the day, like anything that I've ever done that, that, you know, playing in the NFL and being a part of sports illustrated and starting venture back companies and all these things that I've been very fortunate to do, like there's nobody in the room that's working harder than me. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can literally say that now I'm not saying somebody else isn't working out as hard as me, but there's nobody working harder at a certain goal. Once I get my, my eyes locked in on something. And so there's a direct correlation to the people in the room that work the hardest and prepare the most usually have the best results. doesn't always turn out that way, but you put yourself in a position um, that, that good things are, are going to happen. And so, um, you know, Everest is a beautiful mountain and you really st started to see the difference of people fading. I mean, there was a week, you know, again, we started at 21. There was a couple of weeks there where like every day we're flying somebody up the mountain. They were sick. Their lungs blew up with fluid. You just don't know what's going to happen at that high altitude. And then there was a couple others that um, there's this new thing called express Everest, which basically means um, the outfitter will send you a tent and you climb in your tent every night. And so it acts like you're sleeping at 22,000 feet or something And the three people, and what that allows you to do is show up a month later. So rather than be there for two months and suffer, you're only there like the last, you know, 20 or 30 days. And we had three guys do that. All three of them went home. None of them made it. One of the, the key points that I got from the documentary, uh, which is now available on, on YouTube, the link is on my Twitter at Sensei Says Pod. Uh, amazing documentary, by the way. Uh, I, wish, I wish it were longer. I feel like we, uh -huh. we could have gone like way deeper in the subject and uh, 
um, just get some more views and impressions of your adventure, but the 28 minutes is really worth the watch. Um, and I, I comparing your past as a, as an athlete, uh, NFL player, and then the thing changes on the mountain where you go from my objective is to climb two summits, be the first one at that age to do that. And, you know, these bucket lists I've got to hit, like it, it's performance related and not, I got to save my life related. And then it changes during your ascension of Everest. So my question was, in terms of being stimulated, being uh, motivated to, to, um, to complete a certain objective, is an existential motivation stronger than a, than a sport performance related uh, motivation? I don't know if that, that makes any sense, but the source of the motivation to me sounds much stronger if your life depends on it than if it's just, and not to uh, diminish the, the sports related objective, but just related to, to a sport, to winning a championship. Yeah. I mean, they're similar and they're completely different. Right. And, and making a, my finally cracking through the roster and playing at my college, we went to two Rose Bowls, two Lajo Bowls and Orange Bowl. We were always rated in the top 20, you know, we're number one, probably half the time I was at the university of Washington. Um, and, and climbing Mount Everest, it's similar in that there's a goal. You want to get out there. You want to catch balls. You want to be a starter. You want to do all that kind of stuff. When it hit me on Mount Everest, like I was super strong most of the time, most of those two months that I was up there. And, you know, again, things happened. We thought we were going to go for the summit on the 20th and we end up in a cyclone. And so I ended up basically not eating for three days. I was surviving on these little hard candies. And so now on the morning of uh, the 23rd, um, we, we leave at, this is of May of 2021 here. And we, we leave the camp, um, at two, uh, 1230 at night. And, um, you know, they forgot to wake our tent up. That's a whole nother story. And so we had 20 minutes to like, get it going, chop, chop, get out. Let's go, let's go, let's go. So we had nothing, no time to eat. And when you come out of that camp, you're going straight up. I mean, there was no, like you go up a little bit and it plateaus, you go up and say so it was straight up. And I, from, from, from that moment, in addition to, I got snow blind, my left eye, you know, so I couldn't see, um, these are just all things that are hitting me left and right. You know, you're on this wicked 45, 50 mile per hour, you know, uh, storm with this sleet, you know, piercing my eye that hurt. I couldn't see where I was supposed to be, uh, clipping into the ropes. That was a distraction. And so, you know, the motivation was always there, just like it was like under all circumstances, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get to the top. I'm going to play in the NFL. I'm going to start, I'm going to catch these footballs. But where it changed is by the time I got to the top, now I'm nine hours into it. I'm not doing a football game that lasts three hours in my position as a receiver. You know, you're kind of starting and stopping. Um, I'm nine hours, just get to the top. And now I'm in the very top and we're, a lot of people I know have a lot of elation, like, oh my God, this is the greatest. You throw your hands up. And like, I was at my end right there. And I was just like, Shit, now I've got to figure out a way to get back down. And I was out there 18 hours, right? And as I was coming down the mountain, you know, around the, um, the balcony, which is 27.5, um, I ran out of oxygen. My, my shirt had taken off. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm there just at that point, like the second mountain, I could care less because at this, that point I was just like, if I don't figure this out and if I don't get back to this high camp at 26, five, I'm never getting off this mountain. Cause I was the last guy standing up on Mount Everest on that particular day. And so, um, you know, you don't have that people don't die in football. They don't, you know, there may be disappointment because you didn't win the game or you didn't catch the pass or you didn't get in and you're not starting. You wish you were, but you're not going to die. I was stepping over bodies um, uh, towards the top around the Hillary step. My tent mate from 2019, um, uh, Don Cash, um, you know, was laying up there and, and, you know, stepped right over the guy. He was my tent mate for three months or three weeks in, in, in Antarctica in 2019. He later died four months later, uh, on Mount Everest and it was tragic, but it was just like, I don't want to become, 
a statistic, and there's not that many times in your life when you're saying, like, if you walk out, we, we hang up in the podcast and you go do whatever you're going to go work out or go to the store or whatever you're going to do. There's nothing probably in your, this, your day today where you're saying to yourself, today is not the day that I die. <laughs> Yeah. And I was like, like, uh, you know, so you're, you're coming up with all these reasons why not to die. And as you saw from the film that the NFL did searching for the summit, you know, I had to really tap into my daughters, um, my one daughter, Amelia in particular, and just like, I, I can't let her down. I got to keep going for her. I got to tap into all my friends. And these are just the things that were coming out. And like the, the, the last thing I even cared about was I was going to go back down and then go back up Lotsey as I was trying to become the first NFL player to do those. And I was just like, I don't even care. Like, I just, I, at this point, I just got to figure out how I got this mountain. And all things considered, uh, two-parter here. First, was it worth it? And two, uh, what do you take away from uh, the Mount Everest adventure as a human being, uh -huh. as an individual? You know, the question is, is it worth it? Of course, because I made it, right? And people are asking me, would you go back and do it again? And I would say this is that it's kind of a yes and a no. So the no is I don't want to go back to Nepal and spend two months because it's too long, right? And like I said, suffering. I would love to go back if there's a way, which there's not. I would love to go back and recreate that one day because I think I could have done it so much better. If I would have had something to eat, I would have had backup supplies, you know, if I hadn't, if I actually had eaten, I was full of energy, I would think I would have crushed it, but I'll never know that. Right. So if I could go back and create just that one day, I would, I would for, for sure do that. And then, you know, there's, there's, I don't look at just Mount Everest. I look at kind of the whole package of the nine years. And if I go back to kind of like round zero, you know, the reason why I even got into it, I wasn't walking down the street one day and said, Hey, life's going great. And like, let's do the seven summits. I mean, I got into it because I was going through a rough patch in my life. And I just got finally to a point where I got to figure this out and I need to pull a big ass goal to figure out a way to pull myself out of it and give me this, some renewed energy about attacking something. And so as I look back on it, you know, I guess the one big thing for me was, this whole notion of number one, stepping into the fear. And that's why I think so many people, they have a hard time getting off the couch or should I do this or should I do that? And da, 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 da. and at the end of the day, they spend so much time in quicksand, not moving because they haven't stepped into something, especially something that you've never done. I'd climb, but it was more like weekend hikes in the woods. It wasn't like serious climbing up ice walls and, you know, like on Mount Everest, I fell into a crevasse and you know, all those different things, you know, it's, it's a whole different level. Um, that was number one. Number two is, you know, once you step into the fear and you have that big goal out there is you got to go at it um, with daily discipline. And this is another area too, that I've just seen so many people that they have a big goal or it's a new year's resolution and lose weight, or I'm going to go do a, a Spartan race or something and they get into it and trying to keep up that, that consistency. I can tell you this with certainty that I put on over 150,000 vertical feet of climbing last winter, okay? That's a lot of times going up and going down and going up during the winter in snow in awful conditions, 150,000 vertical feet. And I did that because of, I stepped into the fear originally, but then I had the daily discipline. Every single day I said, I have to go up that mountain. I have to go up the mountain because I don't know when or how, but I'm gonna need to tap into this. Little did I know that'd be snow blind, I'd run into a cyclone. I hadn't eaten in three days. Couldn't find my rope. My Sherpa took off on me. You know, I'm on the top of the world by myself. And, and so all those chits that I put in the bank, I all had to take a withdrawal from all those things that I'd, I'd put there. And then the last part of the things, going back to your original question, you know, what you learned, was as I look back on these nine years, nine, 10 years, it's just like, it's one thing to say you're going to have daily discipline. It's one thing to say you're going to step into the fear. But the third thing and the most important thing is you have to commit all in. And just like, like when I was totally 100% committed to, to doing all these things every single day, to put the chips in the bank so that at the end of the day, when in every fabric of my soul, I wanted to quit, man. 
I want to just lay down and either fall asleep or just turn around and go back because that was the easy choice. But I was so committed to what, like come hell or high water, I'm going to get to the top of this thing. I'm not going to be the one guy that, that doesn't. And I was so committed to that. And throughout the entire process of not just a month or two months or three months, but the entire nine-year journey that, you know, I got set back on COVID. I was supposed to go in 2020 and then the whole world shut down. So I had to reset my goals again, right? And like a lot of people think about if you're going to the Olympics and the Olympics canceled, which it did, and you got to go through all that training again. Like, how do you like set your mind like that? And you set your mind ultimately by committing to a process. And that's, those are the three main takeaways I got from that, from the whole yeah, experience. Uh, there's so much in this that uh, I've got to dissect. And uh, we, uh, we discussed all the reasoning and your personal motivation and your personal situation when you decided to Uh, uh, engage in the seven, uh, seven Summit Challenge in episode number three of the podcast. So I highly recommend that anyone watching or listening go in our archives to listen to episode number three, uh, which was uh, recorded uh, during the Spartan World Championship weekend in Lake Tao. Mm -hmm. But so much to discuss here and so little time. Um, <laughs> at the end of everything, you've survived Everest You've put in the decade of dedication, preparation, solely based on a desire to take you out of a very dire personal situation and to exemplify what a professional athlete could vie for in terms of a future. So now it's done. So simple question, did it work? It 100% worked, you know, I, I... You know, the first thing that the mountains gave me, there, there's so many like sub benefits to all this because uh, the mountains gave me complete clarity, you know, it helped the healing number one, then it gave me clarity number two, then I was able to uh, um, turn around and just get centered and, you know, I was able to move on um, in my life. I was going through a divorce with my wife and so you know, things slowly kind of got put back together. I'm with a wonderful girl now. Um, I moved my whole life to Sun Valley, Idaho. So I'm in the mountains, kind of like Tahoe where you and I originally met. Um, and and it, probably the biggest thing is I, I was able to like get real, real clarity on the most important things in life. And my daughter was epilepsy, Amelia. You saw that in the movie. And, you know, from, for me to be able to like, what can I do to help her? And I started a campaign called Amelia's Everest and we've raised probably, I don't know, $60,000 towards that. And it helps people like her, you know, get better. And, you know, the fact is that she hasn't had a seizure in about eight months for the first time since she's 22 now, actually 23, since she was eight years old. And I think a lot of that is because of what I was able to do to, to ultimately give her empowerment because the, the, This campaign kind of made her the star and uh it's you know tim mcgraw has got this great song called humble and kind and it says something like um at the end it says when you get to where you're going make sure you turn around and help the next person in line always remain humble and kind right and i think that's what to me that life is all about in which i've discovered it took me a hell of a long time to get here <laughs> but you know life isn't over till it's over and i think I, i've still got a long way to go Um, and if people want to donate to uh, the charity in question, which is the Higher Ground or, uh, Organization, they've got a link in the uh, the episode description as we speak, and also on our uh, social media at Sensei Says Pod. Um, lastly, the part that I really liked about the the documentary, aside from everything, because I really thoroughly enjoyed it, was seeing you train like specifically mm. for a mountain. I've seen exercises and I've been coaching for about a decade now that I haven't seen, I hadn't seen before. Like you, you seem to train with bands uh, in terms of uh, stimulating stabilization and answering randomly uh, to the environment. But uh, were, were there like fake axes that you train with? Were, were those like, you, you had small handles and I could see, I could see like punch the ground and do some kind of a, push up or something like that uh, uh -huh. or those like um fake handles for uh, for like to si stimulate a si simulate a, an, an axe that you're actually going to use on the mountain um yeah so there's a there's a buddy of mine here in town and he runs a program called hardcore fitness uh 
and you can check that out. You can check out their website, but he basically is very innovative in the way that he trains and really using the six dimensional parts of your body. So, so often, you know, when you do, when you work out, it's just, you're walking forward, you're on a treadmill, everything's very linear like this. And with him, it's, it's jumping up, it's jumping down, it's going left, it's going right. Um, and, and so as I think he also discovered within the, 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 the rubber bands, that's a loose word of saying it. He actually invented this. He's got trademarks on all the stuff that we were doing. Um, but through that, we discovered that there's a lot of similarities of using the ice axe and having to jam that in the ground. But those are all handles that go along with these bands that he created so that we could do all these exercises of going up and going down and doing push-ups. And, you know, I mean, it's really, it's hardcore fitness. It's hard. And hard things are hard. And that's the reason why they're hard, <laughs> you know, and people sometimes get that mixed up. But, you know, again, I, I would go back and say, you know, what, what's that at the end of the day, what's the benefit? Where do you want to go? Where do you want to take your life? And, and, um, you know, for many, it's just the path, the path less traveled or maybe the easy path, better way to put that. And I take the path, path less traveled, um, which is usually the harder path. And, and I, I just, for me, I've found tremendous amount of rewards by taking that particular path. And as we uh, end this, what would be, uh, to your knowledge and experience, the top three exercise and, uh, exercises one should use or train if they were to engage in uh, extreme mountaineering or really, really high mountains? We're talking maybe 10,000 feet and, and up. Well, I mean, look, I... I... Again, I, I, I would like to think that I, I live by example and I lived at the beach and I moved my whole life four years ago to 6,000 feet. So the first thing is get an altitude, right? Get there's no, altitude. Re, there's no replacement to that. The number, the second thing is just like what I did, which is um, once you're in altitude, you have to commit to going vertical and getting vertical. There's no substitute. You can't get a vertical on a stair master or climb master. The only climb master is going straight up and putting those 150,000 mm. vertical feet I put on, on right. And then the, the third thing that I, I do every morning um, is I work out twice a day still. Um, and I, I, and the first thing I do when I wake up, I put my feet on the floor, FOF, and I go down, I have a home gym and I do CrossFit. I CrossFit for exactly one hour. And then in the afternoon, I'm up on the mountain. Happens every day. And so those are the things that have really allowed me to um, achieve. And I have my set, site set. And I'll be in Ecuador in December um, to climb another mountain down there, a big mountain. And I would just continue to goal set to keep me motivated and then actually apply the daily discipline thing of working out twice, twice a day. So maybe a uh, quick words about the documentary uh, Searching for a Summit that the NFL put out. Uh, and people that uh, that uh, people can find it right away on YouTube. It's absolutely free and it's uh, amazingly interesting to watch. So maybe a quick words on the uh, documentary. Yeah, so I was contacted by the NFL um, in uh, January of this last year, earlier this year, 2021. And uh, they ended up flying over to Sun Valley. We did a bunch of filming here, um, a lot of that training, you know, that you saw. And the thing that was wonderful, I think, about the movie is that it wasn't a movie about a guy who's climbing mountains and Mount Everest in particular. It was really about the story of a guy that, you know, was going through a rough patch. We all go through rough patches. Um, we found clarity, uh, turned around and helped his uh, daughter, and um, then was able to actually take on also at the same time Uh, this big challenge of, of climbing Mount Everest with this amazing photography. Um, I took a lot of it just because the NFL was banned from going to Nepal because of COVID. Um, so they had equipped me with GoPros and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, it was hard when you're at your end in terms of your life. You know, the last thing you're thinking about is let's pull out and do a selfie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, let's it's focus, start, right? <laughs> yeah, let's focus. So that, that made it challenging, but I think, I guess I would sum it up this way. And that at the end of the day of the 15 different choices that they could have made, um, as it relates to that film, um, I think they did a, a very fantastic, beautiful job 
of really showing the human motion that we all go through. And it's just not a raw, raw, some guy climbed up Mount Everest. And last question, what's next? Well, uh, <laughs> boy, I've, I've been, uh, I've been signed to a book deal. So we're working on that right now. Nice. And then, yeah. And then, uh, I'm going down to Ecuador to climb a mountain called Cotopaxi. It's 20,000 feet. I'm going to do that on my 60th birthday. If you can imagine that <laughs> I'm going to get up to the top and drop down and do 60 pushups on the summit. So that's <laughs> the goal. I will, I will stand on top on my birthday. Can, so, can, could we argue um, for 60 burpees? <laughs> I, I, that's a lot of burpees i did burpees this morning i just tell you that when it's you like challenges killer. there uh, you go <laughs> yeah 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 burpees are killers uh it makes it a little tougher with crampons on you know going up and down <laughs> but go. anyways i will uh so do that and then i'm working on a uh a big project here in sun valley uh, next june called the seven summit summit and it's essentially bringing a bunch of rock star speakers to be to talk about inspirational things that you know that others have done and then also have a bunch of physical challenges of running up the mountain um so we can challenge them so it's an aspirational inspirational weekend that you're going to walk away from so think of spartan nation um but with a inspirational component where we can bring people together and big name people that that many have know um they have insane accomplishments will be up there to speak that are friends of mine. So um, that's what we're working on. Cool. The documentary, again, is called Searching for the Summit, available on YouTube right away. If you look on our Twitter, at it's his spot. You've got the direct link on there. Also uh, broadcast uh, on the NFL Network. Mark, again, thank you for your time and uh, congratulations. And thank you for all of the inspiration you've given us through this uh, endeavor uh personally uh, it helped me a, a, a lot on a few personal things and al also professional things uh, as you've been uh, uh, participating in this podcast for a third time now so again i'm grateful thank you for for you sir and i really hope that uh, we get to meet uh, again someday soon and hopefully on the summit of a mountain somewhere <laughs> I love that. Such an awesome time uh, spent with Mark talking about everything Everest. Um, I hope that you saw the enthusiasm in my voice and my eyes also <laughs> to have the privilege to uh, talk with such inspirational personalities uh, such a, as Mark is really a privilege uh, that comes with uh, doing the, this podcast. So I really hope you enjoyed the conversation. So let's revisit what we've learned from uh, Mark in terms of preparing physically uh, for uh, anything mountaineering. Number one, get high in terms of altitude, of course. And why is that? Because your body has to acclimatize to the decrease in oxygen saturation in the atmosphere. Um, and why also is that? Because you've got three energy systems in your body. And the third one is aerobic. So it, it requires oxygen to produce energy for your physical output. Less oxygen in the atmosphere means that your body cannot produce as much energy. That's a problem in mountaineering. Uh, it's a prime cause of uh, either injury or deaths, uh, unfortunately. So have the proper info, proper backup, proper training, proper professionals to uh, advise you on how much you've got to acclimatize and how should you do it before engaging in an extreme mountaineering uh, hike or climb. Number two, go vertical. And it's all about specificity here. Uh, if you want to become better at hockey, well, train power skating and train maybe explosiveness of the uh, your obliques to do better slap shots. So if you want to be better at climbing mountains, simple thing, climb mountains <laughs> as simple as that. You've got to build the endurance of your posterior chain, your glutes, uh, your legs uh, in a general uh, sense, but also build the experience, being aware of your environment, uh, analyzing the trail, your safety, uh, maybe spot the weather changes, which are uh, a prime factor of failure or success in mountaineering. Start with uh, lower altitudes, lower elevation and build towards something higher. And through that process, you're also going to learn how to uh, uh, nourish yourself during your expedition, the right gear to, to buy and to practice with. So all the process of going vertical, 
will uh, for sure increase your chances at being successful at that huge mountain you want to uh, accomplish on your bucket list. Number three, cross training, because you've got to have a strong base on which to uh, build your uh, sport specific skills. So your cardiovascular uh, explosiveness, endurance, your mobility, which is really important in uh, mountaineering, your stability. So you want to train your ankles to react like light and quick to stabilize yourself and cross training, functional training is really a good vector of physical development for mountaineering. How about you Saito? Are you a mountaineer, a mountain lover? If you got training tips uh, you want to share with uh, the community, please leave it in the comments or leave it on my social media at Sensei Says Pod or my personal Twitter at Sensei Pascal. Do you have a friend who's a mountaineer, a mountain lover? Cool! Just share this episode to him or her. It's absolutely free, of course. And by the same token, leave a positive review on Apple Podcasts, please, if you think we've deserved it. When we get to 100 reviews, I am giving away a $100 Amazon gift card. Good luck to you. You want to receive the episodes fast and first, sign up to the free newsletter. You've liked this episode and you've shared it. Next thing, subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, hit the bell. On that note, Saitos, I'm gonna see you next week as always. Thank you for watching and listening this week. Us, you are dismissed. Because like, I mean, some people will think you're crazy going hiking. They're like, okay, what are you going to do? Well, we're going to walk for four hours, <laughs> get up somewhere, have a snack and a picture and come back. I went to Iraq. Everyone I told them, they're like, oh, Iraq must be super dangerous. No, it was actually really chill and uh, loved it. In reality, things are a little bit more nuanced. So I think it's good to go and see for yourself. <laughs>